In Jesus' name, we pray this prayer. All God's people said amen. Amen. Maybe so. Amen. I love you, bro. Love you, buddy. Good to me now. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, you know, there's something you need to know about Hopewell. If you're a guest for the first time, we are an independent Southern Baptocostal church. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes we get a little excited that Jesus is alive and that He still changes lives today. We get a little excited when we talk about how He's going to come for us one day and take us home to a place where there's no more pain and suffering. You know, Jesus has changed my life. And I get a little excited when we start singing about Him and, and singing to Him. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it is the cry of my heart that you would surrender your life to Him. There is no better way to live this life than to follow Jesus. You know, we're not perfect. God doesn't exempt us from pain and suffering, but He says this. He said, if you call upon me, I'll answer you, and I will be with you in trouble. Why? Because we love him, and we set our affection on him, and I am so thankful for that truth today. Well, we worship God in spirit and in truth today, and so I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm 1. This morning we kick off a series that will last the entirety of November called Psalms of the Season, and I thought that as we set aside this month for thanksgiving and praise, what better text to do that with than with the Psalms. I love the Psalms. Every morning I read a passage from the Psalms because they're songs of praise to God. Not only do you learn about God in the Psalms, you learn how to praise God and to lift Him up in the Psalms. Uh, Psalms was not entirely authored by David. A lot of people think that King David wrote all the Psalms. He did not. Out of the 150, David is attributed to only 75 of them. There was a man named Asaph, which was a song leader of King David. He wrote a lot of the Psalms. Moses penned one of the Psalms. There's a gentleman named He-Man. Did you know that there was a real He-Man back in the Old Testament times? He penned some of the Psalms. He served the master of the universe. That's just a joke for some of you older guys. He-Man served the, the master of the universe. Uh, Solomon wrote some of the Psalms. In fact, Psalm 1, the, the Psalm we're looking at today, some believe that Solomon penned this Psalm just because of its proverbial style. But we're going to start in Psalm 1 today because it tells us about the blessed man. The blessed man. You know, that's a, that's a popular hashtag these days. Everybody posts pictures of their home or their family and they say, hashtag blessed. Well, we are blessed. If you live in this country, we are blessed. Thanks to the sacrifice of the men and women we celebrated today, we are blessed. We have freedom unlike any other nation on this planet. But I am more blessed not to just live in America, but to know the God of all creation. To be able to call Him my Father, to have a personal relationship with Him. And so Psalm 1 is about the blessed man, the first three verses. That's going to be our focus today. But it also talks, us, talks to us about the cursed man in verses 4, 5, and 6. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the cursed man because let's be honest, when you pass on to, to, to your eternal destination one day and people gather to celebrate your life, friends and family, I don't know of anyone that wants people to get up and say, you know, so-and-so, he was such a cursed guy. He was such an ungodly person. He was so unrighteous and unloving, and he was unkind. And He had a lot of stuff, but he treated pretty much everybody he met like a jerk. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to live a cursed life. Am I right? If you want to live a cursed life, there's something wrong with you. I think all of us at the end of our day would like our friends and family to gather and talk about what a blessed man we were, what a blessed woman we were, and what a blessing we were to others. And so we're going to focus this morning on the blessed man. What makes this person blessed? So if you'll stand with me, please, in honor of God's Word, we're going to look at Psalm chapter 1. I'll be quoting from the New King James Version. It said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, 
nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Father, we pray that you would add your blessing to the reading of the word today. Lord, help us to be men and women who live the blessed life for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And this morning we see two people walking two paths, resulting in two products. And there's really only one choice, the blessed life, the blessed life. So let me share with you a simple outline. In the first three verses of Psalm 1, we're going to see three proofs of the blessed man. The first proof is the blessed man's path, his path. He is separated from the world. Now, this word blessed that we say all the time and use all the time can be translated happy, successful, joyful. If you want to win at life, you want to be blessed. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman, the person. To be blessed by God is to be happy, successful, joyful. The psalmist tells us about a path, not of the blessed man. He tells us the path of the cursed man so that we can infer the path of the blessed man. We have to do a little mind work here. And so take what you read and and go the opposite. And that's the path we're supposed to walk. He, He tells us, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who does not stand in the path of sinners, who does not sit in the seat of the scornful. So let's look at this progression where where the cursed man's feet walk. First of all, he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The fastest way to miss your blessing is to take counsel from those that have no regard for God or his will in this world. We're not to take counsel from them. They have no eternal perspective. In fact, counsel from the ungodly is at, is at best two-dimensional. Most of the time, it's one-dimensional. And when I say that, I, I mean that the ungodly person, if they give you counsel, they're thinking basically of what's in it for me. That's it. That's one-dimensional. What's in it for me? At, at best, they'll say, what's in it for me? What's in it for others? That's two-dimensional. But they don't offer godly counsel. They they don't even consider what God would want, what would honor God, what God's will is. So don't take counsel from an ungodly person if you want to live the blessed life. I've always said that you're supposed to in life ask the right people the right questions. That will help you immensely, young people. Ask the right people the right questions. Don't ask the wrong people the right questions because you get the wrong answer. Don't even ask the, the right people the wrong questions. Ask the right people the right questions and you will be blessed in life. Do not seek counsel from the ungodly and you'll be blessed. Second, he or she does not stand in the path of sinners. Don't hang out with people that influence you towards sin and away from God. Don't spend time with them. The old evangelist says, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. That is so true. We're the sum total of the five people we spend most of our time with. Be careful who speaks into your life. Be careful who you stand with. Don't be in their path. You may cross paths. You may cross paths with the ungodly, but don't stand in their path, right? And when you cross paths, I pray that they see the hope that's in your heart. And I pray that they ask you where that comes from and that you can share Jesus with them. And, and we're commanded to do so, but don't stand in their path. It can lead to a pitiful, pitiful progression in your life. You know, I've discovered that we tend to make bad decisions in life based on who we're with. And most of the time, we don't make bad decisions alone. We're always with somebody, right? They're watching something, so we watch it with them. They're listening to something, so we listen to it with them. They're smoking, so we smoke. They're drinking, so we drink. They're living immorally, so we start living immorally. You need to figure out who the they are in your life and make sure they're pointing you to Jesus and not away from Jesus. Don't stand in the path of sinners. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't stand in the path of sinners. And here we see a pitiful progression from walking to standing to sitting. The blessed man does not sit in the seat of the scornful. Scornful people mock and make light of serious things. Have you ever met a scornful person? They're not just unbiased 
toward the things of God. They're not just ambivalent. No, they're aggressively against it. Anything that's good, anything that's right, they mock it. They're scornful people. I've met scornful people in my life. Say, how does a person get there? Well, they start out by walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Then they stand in the path of sinners. And eventually they're sitting down in a seat of scornfulness and mockery. I I see it all the time. And you might be thinking, Dave, I mean, maybe I've gotten some ungodly counsel in my life. I may have even stood with sinful people. But I can never picture myself openly mocking the things of God. Well, no, it's never immediate. But eventually, it can happen. Casting Crowns had a song called A Slow Fade. And the Course says it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white turns to gray and thoughts invade, choices are made, and a price will be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. When you see people go through something uh, devastating and, and they fall into immorality, it didn't just happen like that. It happened slowly, gradually. They started walking in the counsel of the ungodly. They started standing in the path of sinners, and eventually they sat in the seat of the scornful, and they lost God consciousness. It's a pitiful progression of the cursed man's path. That path, the ungodly man walks, eventually petrifies his heart to everything that's good, everything that's holy, and eventually his heart turns to stone. His heart grows harder. Watch your step. Who are you walking with? What is the path that you're on? Where is it taking you? You need to be careful. The blessed man's path is separated from the world. Tony Evans says there are two answers to every question, God's answer and everyone else's. And when those two disagree, everyone else is wrong. Be careful who you spend your time with. Make sure you're on the right path. Second, we see in verse 2, the blessed man's pleasure. He is not only separated from the world, he is satisfied by the word. But he delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. God's word is his passion. How do we know that? Because he meditates in it day and night. To meditate on something is to recall, ponder, interact with it in the mind. We meditate on God's word. We mentally chew on it until it becomes part of us. We digest it. We take it in. We think about how it connects to life. We ask ourselves, how does the word speak to the circumstances I'm facing? God's will is found in God's word. And Christian, if if you grew up in church, maybe somewhere along the line, you've got this idea that Bible study is something we've got to do. I've got to do that. I've got, it's something we get to do. God wrote a book and we have a copy of it. Sometimes many copies and easily read translations all throughout your house. It's God's love letter to you. We get to read it. We get to read it. Mark Batterson said, when we read the scripture, we're inhaling what the Holy Spirit exhaled thousands of years ago. Think about that. When you open your Bible, you are breathing in what God breathed out. It's alive. It's living. The Bible is the only book that you will ever read that will read you. And so we need to get into God's word until God's word gets into us and saturates us. It satisfies our soul. Don't treat your Bible like a painting on the wall where you occasionally glance at it as you walk by. You should always know where your Bible is on Sunday morning because it's right where you left it Saturday night. Amen? Yeah. Spurgeon said, there's enough dust on some of your Bibles to write damnation with your finger. It's sad but true. I talk to many people as a pastor who say, I'm just spiritually dry. I just don't know. I just don't sense God's presence in my life. You know what I want to say? Where have you planted yourself? Are you, have you planted yourself in God's word? Are you being refreshed by him daily? Nine times out of 10, the answer is no. If we're not in the word, the world will get into us. 
Instead, we need to get into God's word until God's word gets into us. In 2022, I'm going to challenge you as a church to read through the entire Bible with me chronologically. Okay? How many of you have ever read through the entire Bible in a year? Okay? We're going to do it. I'm going to challenge you as a church. We're going to do it together, and we're going to do it chronologically. That means in order of epics of time. Not like it's laid out in, in, your, in the canon of Scripture here, but as it unfolded in history, because history is His story. And so I wanted you to see throughout the timeline of humanity how God has dealt with mankind. So we're going to read it chronologically. We're going to give you the plan. It's a version plan, so we'll give you the link so you can find it on your version app, so that every morning there it is, and you know exactly what we're reading together. Starting in January, for those of you that don't even know what version is and you've never heard of an app, we're going to have it printed out for you a quarter at a time. You'll be able to pick it up so you can track right along with us, and you'll have that sheet of paper right next to your Bible, and you'll be able to open up and check off what you read every single day, and we're going to read through the Bible chronologically together as a church. Why such a commitment to reading through the Scriptures? Because, listen, if my job as a pastor is to equip you, I I truly believe 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. If my job is to equip you for every good work, I need to get you into the Word. This sermon will not sustain you all week. You may eat a big meal Sunday afternoon, but you're going to get hungry again throughout the week. Why do I want you to study God's Word? Because I need more than one meal a week to sustain me so that I can grow. We need to get into God's Word. The blessed man is satisfied by the Word. He loves it. He can't get enough of it. Isaiah 55, 11 says, It is the same with my Word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. God's Word is powerful. It will change your life. The blessed man's path, the blessed man's passion. Now let's look at the blessed man's produce. He's situated by the water. Verse 3 says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that brings forth his fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. He's like a tree planted by flowing Streams, such trees have deep roots. And they might be swayed, but they hold their ground. And they bear fruit when the season's right, they bear fruit. It indicates that the blessed person is productive. They're maximizing their potential for God. And importantly, it's something that you need to understand the fruit they produce exists for others. When I have a fruitful life, The fruit from my life feeds not just my faith, it feeds my family, my friends, my co-workers. It feeds this fellowship when I have a fruitful life. You want to know how you can make Hopewell a dynamic church in Hall County? Be faithful. You be faithful. You get into God's Word. Seek God's will and say, God, I want to be so close to you. If we all do that, then heaven only knows the impact this church will have here and around the world. Get into God's Word. Situate yourself by the living water. Be rooted, rooted. You know, sometimes we get spiritually dry, burned out. And so where are you planted? Are you by the streams of water? Maybe you're spiritually dry because you're drinking more from the faucet of social media than you're drinking from the well of Scripture. Maybe you're dry because you're taking in more from the hose of Netflix and Hulu than you are from the well of the Word. Maybe you're asking Google more than you're asking God. Maybe you're looking for hope from CNN or Fox News when it can only be found in Jesus Christ. Man, I've stopped watching the news regularly. I'm up to speed on the the, the things that happen, but as far as just camping out and watching breaking news every five minutes, no. That'll depress you. It'll stir up anxiety in your heart. It'll pull your focus from the vertical to the horizontal in a heartbeat, and you'll be a depressed believer. You won't be a blessed man, a blessed woman. Sometimes we find hope from false wells. 
Jeremiah 2.13, Jesus rebukes his people. He said, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Don't go looking for hope in the wrong well. If you're thirsty for meaning and purpose, read God's word. The rest of the wells are false wells. Everybody's looking for a new revelation from God. Just read the old, old story. God's already given us His revealed will, His revealed truth. Spurgeon said he does, God, he says um, in, in a message that the Spirit does not comfort us by any new revelation. Rather, he says, he does so by telling us old things over and over again. He brings a fresh lamp to manifest the treasures hidden in Scripture. He unlocks the strong chest in which the truth had long lain, and He points us to secret chambers filled with untold riches. It's in God's Word, God's will. The secret to a fresh and fulfilled and productive life is found in the Word of God. To be fruited, you have to be rooted. Plant yourself by the living water. And then when the winds of life blow hard, you remain strong. You know, some of us, we stand firm, our faith stands firm through some mild inconveniences, right? The line was so long at Chick-fil-A today, but praise Jesus, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be kind, you know? <laughs> the coffee that I ordered from Starbucks isn't quite what I ordered, but you know what? I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to be a blessing. My faith is strong. And we're proud of ourselves for that. But man, when something major blows through, a diagnosis, the death of a loved one, financial insecurity, our tree topples, doesn't it? And exposes a very shallow root system. We want fruit, but without the root, it's not going to happen. We need to be rooted down deep. Down deep. Colossians 2, 6 and 7, Paul says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. We come to Jesus by grace through faith because of the undeserving love of Christ. Those are the taproots of our faith. They go down deep in the way we stay rooted in Christ is the same way we came to Christ. By grace, through faith, because of the undeserving love of God. Those are the taproots that run down deep that will keep us strong when the winds of life threaten to topple us over. We, we survive the storm because of God's grace, through faith, because of God's undeserving love. And it's in those times of doubt and confusion when our circumstances are upside down that we can say, Jesus loves me. This I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. Not my circumstances. Not this valley I'm walking through. I know He loves me because the Bible tells me so. And no matter what we're going through, we can say, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, he loves me. The Bible tells me so. And we stand firm because we're planted by streams of living water. We are blessed in Jesus. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves of that. Everybody say, I am blessed. I am blessed. You are blessed. You are. Well, there's another man that's mentioned in this passage. Remember, I said there's two people, two paths that result in two products. We were focused on the blessed man's path, but in verses 4, 5, and 6, there is the cursed man, the ungodly man, the unrighteous man, and the psalmist says that he is driven, he is doomed, and he is damned. He says in verse 4, the ungodly are not so, they're not like this, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away like the chaff. And in the ancient process of winnowing wheat, the kernel of grain was separated from the husk. And when the kernel fell to the threshing floor to be collected, the worthless husk and other parts, the chaff would be blown away. And it's a waste. It's a waste. 
everything that we enjoy in this life without Jesus Christ is simply waste. It's a waste. It's not eternal. One day it will be burned up. It will be driven away. So anyone who lives their life apart from Jesus Christ, apart from knowing their maker, is living a life of waste. The world will waste away. It will be driven away. Not only are they driven, they're doomed. Verse 5 says, therefore, they will not stand in the judgment. When they stand before a holy God, in their sin, all that awaits them is God's wrath. Why is God so wrathful? Because he's just. A loving God is a just God. If God were unjust, he would not be loving. And because he's just, he has to judge sin. And if you reject his only provision for sin, you stand condemned and you await the wrath of Almighty God. And when you stand before him, you are doomed without Jesus. Doomed. You hear people say, well, I'm a good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. None of us is sinless. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. I wouldn't trust the best 15 minutes of my life to please God because I might be doing the right thing, but it's, for, it's with the wrong motive. As I stand before God, I need the covering of Jesus Christ. I need his grace, his mercy on me, but the cursed man, the ungodly man, doom awaits him. He'll be driven he is doomed, and finally he is damned. Verse 6 says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Death, separation from God. You know, we sang that song, and most of us were rejoicing about the day that Jesus will come for us. He's going to come for us. Why? Because if you know him, he's coming to take you home. But if you do not know him, he's coming to send you to hell. And that's why I'm saying, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, trust Him today. We're not promised tomorrow. And all that waits the ungodly, unrighteous, cursed man is death, hell, and destruction. Trust Him today. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. As we think of the blessed man this morning, I want you to know that we have been blessed as a church with some godly men and women. Man, as I have uh, gotten used to this position of being your pastor, I've been so humbled. Meeting some of you, I'm trying to learn everybody's name, and you all are gracious uh, with me about that. I'm, I'm doing my best. But as I meet people, men and women, I'm meeting more and more people that love Jesus with all their heart. I'm meeting more and more people that, that loving Jesus isn't just a Sunday morning thing. It impacts their life Monday through Saturday too. I'm meeting more and more people that worship Jesus at work, that worship Jesus at home, that worship Jesus when they're around strangers, and that look and pray for opportunities to share the love of Christ with those who don't know Him. Just this last Wednesday night, I, I enjoyed spending time with our band of brothers. They meet every Wednesday night. And I was just listening to stories of how these men were faithfully sharing their faith through the week with different people, praying with this group of men in the parking lot of Kroger, sharing Christ with a coworker, always looking for an opportunity to be a light. Yesterday, we had an incredible women's event, a ladies' tea, where our ladies brought lost loved ones and friends and family members so they could hear the gospel. We are blessed as a church. We have incredible disciples, people that are on the right path. They, they, they take pleasure in God's word, and they have produce. Their branches are heavy with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. By the way, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not just healthy church attendance or influence in this congregation. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, faith. That's the fruit he's talking about. Well, I hope we're blessed. We have a wonderful 
group of folks here, blessed men and women, but if you're here this morning and this passage does not describe you, there's hope. We've been singing about it all morning. Jesus came. He lived the perfect life, a life that you could never live. And then he paid the price for your sin on the cross. He shed his innocent blood so that it would cover you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Then he was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he has the power to save you. And all you have to do is in simple childlike faith, Turn from your sin and trust him to save you. And he will. He'll save you. Will you stand with me this morning? As our musicians come to play, I want to give you an opportunity to come and make a choice. There's two people, there's two paths, there's two products, but there's really only one choice. One choice. And you need to choose Christ today. Choose Christ. He will bless your life. He will bless you. And if you need to trust him as your savior, there's going to be pastors here during this time of invitation. We would love to show you from God's word how you can be saved and know without a doubt that you are living a blessed life. If you want to just come and pray, the altars are open. But if you need to trust Jesus, choose him today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the right path. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the worship that lifts you high. Lord, we do not take for granted our salvation. We do not take for granted your sacrifice for our sin. And Lord, we want to be blessed. We want to be men and women that put you first in every area of our life. We want to walk the right path, Lord. We want your word to be our passion. And we want the fruit from our faith to feed all those around us for your glory, Lord so that you would be praised. Have your way in this time of invitation today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come if you need to pray this morning.